ir ponai labai džiaugiuosi, kad šiandien su mumis žaliuoju dėl podcast'e turim labai gerą mano draugę iš Amerikos, Megan Rutiglianu, kuri buvo atsakinga labai ilgą laiką už Burning Man bendruomenės formavimą ar puosilėjimą visam pasaulyje. Jis šiandien su mumis kalbės apie bendruomeniškumą, apie piliečių įsitraukimą į politinius procesus. Ir kadangi mes esam žali iš prigimties ir mes tikim, kad piliečių įsitraukimas yra vienas svarbiausių žalių, žalios filosofijos aspektus, aš labai tikiu, kad Megan yra vienas iš tų žmonių, kurie labiausiai geriausiai gali mums apie tai papasakoti. Megs, I am so delighted to have you on our podcast today. It's so mutual and I have a question for you. Shoot. Cape Tau Sekese. <laughs> you look sexy as well. <laughs> It's cool. Wow. You know, the Lithuanian well, language travels from? well. <laughs> um, I, I do remember just a little bit of Lithuanian and how I would say bye to my friends. It'd be, Ike pasi matimo. Yeah, <laughs> you say it so nicely. You know, the funny <laughs> thing is that... Sounds all like Lithuanian, but... <laughs> you, have, you have Italian heritage, is that right? Yeah, Italian and Irish. So like for... Italians and Latin Americans uh, pronouncing Lithuanian is much easier than for, for say, the Irish or the Americans, just because of the, <laughs> just the phonetics. Yeah, they're very good for it. All right. Well, so, thank you so much for inviting me to chat with you. This is such a cool way to start my day. I'm just delighted to hear more about what you're up to. It's lovely. Sister, I'm, I'm happy. I'm really happy you found the time. I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to tell everybody who's listening to us now that Megs is a person who is amazing at holding spaces and as a performer who likes to bring people together, I think that you better than anyone understand that a community is an exceptional state of togetherness. It's, it's creating a space where everybody's heard and where everybody found, finds a voice. And uh, I've told many of my friends that, you know, if you think I'm good, you should, you should check out Megs and the way that she holds a space and she makes everybody feel at home. A, amongst people that they've maybe never even met. And so one of the first things I wanted to ask, ask you about was how do you make people feel at home in a community? What are the preconditions necessary for that magical state of togetherness to occur? I would just really try to get to know who the community members were in advance so that when they mm -hmm. came, I could greet them and make sure that I was um, helping to introduce them to one another. It's also good if in advance people have a sense of how long something's going to be, why they're there. So I would always try to send some information to kind of get them oriented to the themes or to what the format would be if it was conversational and then the next day would be the opening. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, but, but being silly and, uh, and being able to greet people by name, I think is really important um, as an organizer. I mean, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, it, it acknowledges the importance of a human being that you remember their name or you know their name. It really makes them feel special. And silliness is really good because it, it demonstrates that you can be vulnerable in that space, that people can relax and they can put their guard down, right? Yeah. Now, talking about community building, specifically community building, um, previously you had mentioned that one of the important things when building a community is... Um, common values, a common set of values. In Burning Man, it was the 10 principles where people knew that there was something that they could expect uh, from a space, correct? And, yeah. and you'd also briefly mention that it's very important for people to be able to step into that space and to be able to participate in that space. Um, would you like to elaborate more on that or tell us more about what other preconditions are necessary for a proper vibrant community? Oh, absolutely. So I definitely think having a common set of values that are accessible and not too, um, too intense. Like, I think it's important that you can agree on a certain way that you want to interact. Um, and also what you're striving for. We believe that our community, in the case of Burning Man, would be radically inclusive. We would welcome the stranger and turn them into a friend. Um, it would be a space for people to participate. And um, the Burning Man 10 principles really um, were foundational for people feeling like, okay, those are some things that I can agree on, even as an independent thinker. So how do you make people that are usually 
following their own, marching to the beat of their own drum, feel like part of a collective. And I, I think you have the capacity to do that with this Green Party because, I mean, you, you can appeal to people's sense of, um, of what's right and wrong and also make it fun and entertaining um, and a space for them to get to share what they're excited about and then also what's, what's difficult for them and give them a chance to get some advice. Well, that, it's very curious you should mention it. You see, it, I make one of the, I suppose, one of the, one of the, one of the assumptions I make is that a lot of people who are progressive are empathetic, you know, by nature. And they also are empathetic to nature. And so when you talk about green values, I say a lot of people are green. They just don't know they're green. And even yeah. like, right, Burning Man was, is a very curious example because the 10 principles came or came, came to be a bit later on when people from the org or from the community told Larry, hey, can you, can you describe what's happening? Because people had it within them when they came together, they could, they could manifest or they could, um, they could channel that energy. But sometimes you need very concrete cognitive kind of like words or poetry or some kind of verbal guideline to make it happen, right? Yeah, I think um, too, being able to showcase that people will feel more welcome in a, in a burner community or in the unsettled community, which I'm working on now. And then you're um, you know, green community in Lithuania, if they also see that there's not a one size fits all, that, the, that there's a variety and a diversity to the, the people that comprise the group. So when you have opportunities to showcase um, different voices and also divergent um, examples of the principles or of the values in action, that's also really good because it makes people it gives people more options to see what they align with, even within a common sense of alignment. And that makes so much sense, especially because like, okay, you're completely right. Say the, the beauty of Burning Man as well is that, is that you have certain kind of like cognitive dots, but you are allowed to connect them your own way and to interpret them your own way. And, and so with the Greens also, um, it's very curious because a lot of people think that political philosophy should be very much uh, top down you know, you're going to pick a strong leader or somebody who's going to say, this is what we're going to do. But when you want people to get engaged, they have to see themselves in a vision. They have to see themselves in a culture. They have to see themselves in that whole framework, right? Um, so for me, uh, also, I think that's important. But let me ask you, in your community, your new community right now in Unsettled, how, how, are, you, how are you bringing that in? What's the state of that community and where are you trying to transport it to? Uh, so I lost you for just a minute. So will you just ask me that question one more time? Sure. Uh, you're, you're working on a new community. And, yeah, and yeah. Like, I believe the vibrant communities are about creating just enough space for people to see themselves in them. A vision which is, is not so defined that you can still improvise your own or find yourself within that vision, right? So yeah. you're coming into a new thing, unsettled, and you're bringing something in. So where do you want to transport that community to? Well, it's the first experiment for me is going to be how weird can I be? Um, because I've already started to think about the guests that I want to bring into some of the topics. And I'm like, I'm going to bring some psychedelic San Francisco clowns. Let's see what the, the group thinks about. Um, but it's also a lot of community organizing is about um, being able to recognize people's talents and then asking them to lead things because to your point that you were making earlier about a lot of the time people think that there needs to be a strong leader and that things are top down, a really effective leader of a um, kind of zany and independent thinking, um, you know, group who want to be uh, united in community, a, a big role of the facilitator is to recognize people's talents and potential contributions and then mm -hmm. um, help them see where they can make a contribution where they didn't necessarily already see it. Right. So if you see that someone, Jorgis, is really active on the, um, the email lists or on Slack and they're helping to give people answers, you might say, wow, can you help be like our, you know, information czar? Empowering individuals, right? 
Yeah, so, and asking them to do things that they didn't necessarily see that they um, could do. So there were a lot of people I would ask to speak at those conferences who didn't ever think of themselves as a speaker. Um, and then with the unsettled group, I'm going to be reaching out to people on a personal level and saying, hey, Dennis, will you um, lead a session on how to stay organized? Because you're the most organized guy in our community. So figuring out ways to empower contributions people are naturally making. And it's fun to give titles, especially if they're silly. So like, you know, the czar of music eclecticness. Like there's just <laughs> cute things that you can do to make people feel, um, feel like they're key contributors. That's, that's, I, I love the playfulness aspect. I mean, because uh, people forget that play is one of the most important or one of the most, um, uh, one of the best spaces, a playful space is a space where we can grow, right? It's, it's a space where it, things are exciting enough so we don't get bored, but where we feel safe enough to experiment. And people forget that a lot of children actually develop a lot of their cognitive and social abilities through play, right? Knowing that they're in, a, in, a, in that space where um, they can say something and there, there won't be fatal repercussions. But we've That's forgotten right. as adults that kind of importance, you know, that, that, and that for someone to give us that space. And I like to do that through music. And You're so great at that. You're uh, such a talent. I mean, you are just incredible. So uh, when you're doing your, your organizing with the Green Party in Lithuania, are you performing too and having them participate with you? Well, that's the thing. I haven't, I haven't gone on to that. For me, initially, the whole idea was if you find enough people, it's my assumption is that there is enough people who are naturally green, green in their heart, right? And if you talk to them, if you empower them, if you hear them out, if you let them feel that they can be a part of the community, then they will feel that that's something they want to be a part of. And the second, the second thing I'm, I'm aspiring for, I'm really hoping that we can get it done before the, um, the elections, is to have a community platform, a digital platform where you can articulate opinions, where you can sign petitions, where you can do gatherings, where you can like really, really get community action and civic action um, organized and somehow did it through that kind of digital space. So that's something I'm, I'm aspiring for. I, I personally believe very much in the playfulness. And as, as you know, I shared these elements with you earlier. It's like, they're you know, so good. Help people understand playfulness. So this is, this is nonviolence, right? As I mentioned, and this is this is social justice because, you know, you have to have a big heart if, if you expect to get privilege. If you want rights and privileges, you also have to um, understand that there's something you have to contribute to the community. And uh, this one is for um, sustainable development. And this one I is for... I love yeah, but, but, but so the idea is that you make people, even a child... Um, help them understand what we're talking about. And so we're going to move on to that at some point. But for me, it's kind of tricky because, you know, people think that political is bad. And I think that there's kind of like two, um, two myths. The first is that all politics is dirty and that all politics is really boring and difficult. And, and even like through the Burning Man prism, you realize that even though people say that this is completely apolitical, if you get civic engagement going, if you make a communal effort, if you work um, along the lines of something which goes beyond money, which is, which is decommodification. Those are very, very political decisions you're making. Yeah, they are. And I think it's important um, to distinguish between political and partisan. It's, like, it's mm -hmm. important to, um, to activate people and talent and resources in support of your values. And I don't think that there's something about that that we should be scared of. Um, and so if you, if your community there and the community that you're growing can agree that social justice is of high importance, renewable energy is of high importance, having mm -hmm. um, values and tenants that um, bring you together and that you can activate other people around, I think that that's great. I think that endorsing um, things that are harmful, that's like something that you don't want to do. So it really depends on the perspective, but this time more than ever has really shook me um, and that it is important for creatives um, like us to be in the public arena and making our voices heard because 
we don't really get a second chance at helping to um, save the planet and also making sure that um, we don't go back to systems that are hierarchical and, um, and don't have um, the, the common interest of the people in mind. But that's so, so, I mean, I think we're all agreed on that. It's this kind of activism is necessary now. Participative yeah. involvement is something that, that the world needs. It's like, and especially from, from the activists and the dreamers who've been at the, on the sidelines the whole time saying, hey, we need change, we need radical change, something needs to happen. And now, especially after COVID, I feel that it's like this big opportunity to step in. And if you look at the United States landscape, all the craziness that's happening there, um, I wanted to ask you, isn't it difficult in this kind of like crazy bipartisan environment to have a constructive conversation and actually build bridges? I mean, how, A, is it difficult? B, how do you, how do you go about to kind of disarm that situation? I think that is the, the question and the challenge. Yesterday, for example, I'm staying with my parents in Pennsylvania and we, um, we drove to a winery yesterday, but we drove through all of this Trump territory and you know, it's like for me, I, I have cognitive di dissonance because I hear about it and I know that, you know, even if it's 40 some percent of people support Trump, they're not usually a part of my social circle or even the city <laughs> environments or my home life. But, but, you know, people with different viewpoints are out there. And I think, man, I mean, maybe it really does come down to this playful element. Like maybe it really does come down to entertainment um, to making things accessible. Because if you have a big parade in the streets of Vilnius with those big shapes and um, you get your community to dress up and you're playing music, I bet you can crack those smiles, even of your staunchest opponents. Yeah. Um, so I think it's also probably about not taking oneself too seriously. But seriously enough that they pay attention. <laughs> They're in life yeah. attention. <laughs> of, co of course. I mean, but isn't that a curious thing, right? So I, I like that idea, like make it entertaining, but you're right, but, but enough with enough substance for people to take it seriously, right? And I think that was one of the crazy things about Burning Man as well, right? Because here's people who are supposedly just having a big bash party in the desert, you know, with all kinds of debauchery, but they're actually, we were actually modeling uh, protopia, utopia in the desert. And, and that was the most inspiring thing that you could actually for one moment feel that, wow, this is what that could look like. And this is yeah. us putting that together. And, and again, you kind of return to that whole kind of playful, uh, that, that the importance of play and simulating things. Um, but in that scheme, trust is super important. Um, and trust is not easy to build. Um, I, think, I think, can I ask you very candidly, um, and I know you've dealt with also a lot of um, uh, toxicity within Burning Man culture, and you've de dealt with all kinds of like uh, difficulties and dramas and stuff like that. What what would you do to maintain the trust and the cohesion of that community, um, or of any community? You know. Yeah, um, a couple things, and this is something I'm starting to impress on the guys from Unsettled. I think there ha there has to be in addition to, this is my, my opinion, in addition to the, the values that bring a group together and create a sense of shared vision and, um, and that make people feel um, connected, I think that there also has to be a bit of a, of a structure to fall back on, like a code of conduct, even if it's mm -hmm. just, um, we believe that this Green Party, for example, needs mm -hmm. to be needs to provide a safe container where people can express themselves without fear of, um, mm -hmm. you know, people turning on them or, you know, violent, um, you know, speak of any kind. And this way, as a leader and a facilitator, part of holding space is also being willing to be the person that asks somebody to tone it down or to take a time out um, because Without that to fall back on, it can be really hard. And one, one person who really is stirring the pot in a negative way can be a huge energy drain and can really yeah. pull the focus from the objectives that you're trying to achieve. So you can be really open in your welcoming and really open in the 
you know, rollout of, okay, the Green Party believes in these four main things, but then you also need to say, but as participants and as contributors and as community members, we also need to agree that we will um, be respectful of one another, that we will um, listen more than we talk. Um, so mm -hmm. I would always at those conferences try to create um, a few ground rules. And it sort of seems a little funny when you do it, but you get used to it because if you don't say it, then it hasn't been said and then there's not a standard. Um, and so I think one way to insulate and protect the community from too much drama is to have some documentation of what poor participation looks like. That's super interesting, right? So you have shared values, you have participation, uh, and then you also need kind of like a code of conduct, something to keep just, just enough of a, of a framework, right? Just so you have guidelines, well, not even guidelines, just kind of like certain, and I think beyond guidelines, they're kind of like key behaviors where people know what to expect, right? Um, yes. And see, the curious thing is right now with the, with, the, with the Green Party, what I'm doing is that I'm not trying to change the party itself. I'm trying to create a community around it, which will, be, will, which will bring in that energy, which will kind of help uh, articulate what we expect from a from a political unit um, and and that's a curious thing because you can create a safe space and anarchy is great but a, a safe space can only be maintained right if, if you've got certain key what do you call it kind of like uh, uh um safeties right kind of like safety switches where people say that's a foul that doesn't work for me and they have to be enforced as well right um do you think yeah I, 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 I've always thought that Burning Man culture is very feminine, that it's, it's a very feminine culture and, and, that, and, and, and that the leadership is very feminine in the way that it's kind of like, um, there's this good, which says, it says men, men lead from, from the front where they're kind of like, this is the way we're going and all you fuckers come after me, you know, come behind me. <laughs> Whereas women, women lead from behind where they're empowering people. And, and at least I got that feeling that a lot of Burning Man culture was very much about empowering others. Did you feel that kind of feminine leadership or that, or that kind of angle while you were there? Oh yeah, 100%. I mean, the, uh, the Burning Man organization is run by these exceptionally talented and very strong females. Um, and the guys are also really strong and really smart, uh, but there is definitely um, it's more of a matriarchy, I would say, which I thought was really interesting. But um, there's also some really masculine parts of Burning Man in terms of the expression of the city itself, right? That like drive to achieve and accomplish and that big art and like building and constructing and, it, it, and engineering. So, you know, the things that are also kind of typically or stereotypically male it's like we, we need each other um and all points in between to uh, to build a city and a community like that That's but yeah amazing. i like what you were saying about the leading from behind because i think um especially at, as you're trying to build momentum towards something that might have a lot of new participants being able to show them where they can contribute or where they can um lead or where they can self-organize, I think is really important. So within a, a really well-held community, you want to see a lot of self-organizing. You want to see people taking ownership of projects. We had a phrase in Burning Man that we called it a duocracy. So if someone was saying, you know what we should really do, we should really build a library where we know all the regional contacts and, and we say great you are voluntold well, you just voluntold yourself that that's what you're going to do <laughs> if you want that so you have to um maybe one of the things you can introduce to is having people um, take responsibility for the outcomes that they want to see um so that um they they understand that they have a sense of agency within the container that you're trying to create I love that. I think that's so important. You know, the whole voluntold, if there's a job, it's yours, the whole duocracy thing. It's curious because I really, you know, the world has gotten so complex lately. You know, there's no two sides to a story. 
there's 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 no simple explanation and and in this age of memes you know you understand that even even the best kind of like sassy comedy it kind of comes at the expense of something else <laughs> and what we need now is yeah it's like it's oversimplification you know at the at the expense of the complexity of the situation and 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 you know i feel that we right. need to listen yes. more and that we also need to own our own outcomes you know it's very easy to suggest somebody to do something or to say wouldn't it be nice if it was like this or like that but even executing that has its own implications you know it has its own consequences and so what you really need is people to get involved in those spaces and that's why I think that the burns and not just the one in Nevada is so important because people really get to experiment that kind of um, the fruit of that kind of um, horizontal integration. Um, obviously, Megs, that's not exclusive to Burning Man, right? So let me ask you, where else do we see these exam great, great, great examples of horizontal resilient communities? You know, a group that I've been paying attention to lately is Extinction Rebellion. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a global organization that um, does some interesting um, protesting and organizing around humans not wanting to be an extinct species. <laughs> and I, I kind of got involved, but then I realized I was involved in a lot of things. But um, basically, if you're a community member, you can orient other communities. So they empowered community members um, to bring on new community members without a lot of rigor. So that was a very key way that they were decentralizing things. And that's something that we did with Burning Man um, to grow the global network. We would empower some regional contacts that we would vet, but then we didn't really put a lot of a frame around how they could organize um, locally. And that, that worked well in some cases. And then sometimes it was difficult because people didn't necessarily like their leadership style. But um, I think that's a good example of a network. And gosh, um, I don't know, I'll have to give that a little bit more thought. But what about you? What are some examples that you like? I, I was I was actually shook by the Rainbow Gathering. First time I went to ah. a Rainbow Gathering here in Lithuania. I actually went to a Rainbow before I went to the Burn. And so uh, it was funny, yeah, because when I went to the Rainbow, Gateway I had, gathering. man, it's complete <laughs> hippie heaven, man. And the thing is, I had yeah. no expectations, but I actually returned my faith. I got my faith in humanity back at the Rainbow uh, because I was, I was like, I studied political science and, you know, I have an MBA. So, so it's like, I'm, I know, I know the, I know the, I know, I know how rigorous systems should. I used to believe in rigorous systems. Let me just say that, uh, to create order in the world. And and at the rainbow, I kind of understood that. Wow, like this isn't anarchy the way we understand it. But people don't necessarily need rigorous rules to create a good system. What you need is values, and you need and you need a space where people can step in. And so I actually, when I went to and Burning Man, music. After, what? And good music, but music is an expression of the culture, right? But, yeah. but, and again, you can return to the music through the fun, through the kind of like that whole aspect of let's celebrate life together. And so why, why I was, I also fell completely in love with Burning Man is because that was kind of like a rainbow thing, but it was, it scaled so nicely, right? And it was kind of like, it wasn't anachronistic in the way that, that rainbow was very tribal. Um, I felt the Burning Man was tribal in a more contemporary way where we had, we had modern culture and modern creativity expressing itself vibrantly yeah. in, that, in that medium. Well uh, said. But I have, seen, I have seen other examples. You know, I've seen examples, uh, for example, of indigenous people in, um, in Colombia, right? So they will have tribes, but the way they select people or that the, way, the way they reach consensus very often will not be about people saying their opinion, but everybody's shutting up and the moment that they shut up is when they feel that we've agreed, we have nothing more to discuss. You know, there's these kind of like very subtle things where you understand you don't need to over-regulate people for them to be better human beings. And in many cases, when you over-regulate things, things just become cumbersome and boring and fastidious and just that. You know? Yeah. Um, I would, my advice to around this party organizing Try to go for as long as you can before you start creating formal committees. I just oh, yes, think for sure. it's that, that part of um, 
of community organizing can be very cumbersome because it's hard to cycle people out of what they consider to be like leadership roles. So keeping it more, I'm really leaning more towards the flat organizing mm -hmm. model um, and that if people have a very clear sense of their responsibilities and their goals and they're trusted to achieve them, um, that they're gonna be more effective um, in most cases. So I, what I was so excited about when I joined the Unsettled team um, just recently, just a month ago, is like, I have a boss, but he was like, I'm kind of your boss, but you're really your own boss. So, you know, we have to write our goals for the week and share them with one another, but there's just an accountability that comes with us being our own agents. And I yeah. wonder if there's a way that within the party that you're organizing, you can um, create uh, a space wherein people are um, supported by the community to execute on the objectives that they feel are important, but they are responsible for owning and managing their time according to that. And if something fizzles out and then someone stronger who just has more time or more contacts or whatever it is, um, less you know, drama um, can organize it and build on their good work, then, then that's great. But I think that sometimes committee structures are where good ideas go to die. They bore the fuck out of me. Yeah, so that's it's, one thing it's, that... I, I can't do it. I mean, and, and actually it's funny because I, I, during these whole podcasts, we hadn't actually mentioned the party as much. I was just talking about the community and, and very deep inside, one of my feelings is that like I've been, I've been, I've, I'm working with the party to renew it and make it more 21st century. But I think that the renewal you need is not at a party level, it's at a community level. And again, a lot of the policy, the good policy, it, it's done through communication, through people talking, through people engaging processes. And even to be very honest, as a person who, who, who believes less and less by the day in the, in the top down approach to solving problems, it, I really see this, that community empowerment is the key and then having the party as the tool to to express that political will or that or aggregate that kind of political opinion so for me a party is more of a tool whereas what you really need is a community and the funny like thing is that. is that yeah i and it and, and it's strange because many people will say oh that's really an anarchic way of looking at stuff and it's like but the funny thing is is like man i've been talking to educators i've been talking to um climate change specialists. I've been talking to uh, all kinds of really interesting people and, the, and what everybody's saying is that you don't need change. You don't need to build new schools. You don't need to, to like, you, you don't need brick and mortar change. You, you don't need to focus so much on the CO2 emissions. What you really need to focus on is on a shift in the mind and in the heart. You need to elevate conscientiousness because the moment that people become more conscientious, they start to make better decisions. And start, the moment that they start taking better decisions, the change comes on its own. And so that's why I believe like for me, you know, and I'm so sad that the burn's not gonna happen this year. Me too. Because for me going to the burn, it's, it, it, kind of, it kind of like resets my social settings. I, again, I start believing in humanity again and I start believing in human goodness because I see that, wow, these people aren't doing it for the money. Wow, these people aren't doing it because somebody told them to. Wow, these people aren't doing it because um, they're trying to impress somebody they're doing it from the goodness of their heart. And so when you enter that system, you actually feel that you elevate yourself. And so for me, that's, that's the power of community. Yeah, and I think, um, so I, I think that you're just such a light. I think that you, it's good to have a place for you to recharge. Um, and I do, I will really miss the, uh, the burn this year. And really also for the family reunion aspect of it and getting to see all of our people. Um, but tell me, tell me about some of the, the folks in Lithuania, like how are things going? How, what, what activities is the community um, around the Green Party? Like what, what are you guys up to? Well, uh, concretely with the Green Party, I mean, I mean, what I feel is that we are just dis disconnected from nature, right? And that is the main issue is that uh, we have uh, completely forgotten that we have a relationship with nature and that we should be together with it and that we're not separate from nature, right? And, um, you know, there's a really good, there's a really good um, quote by, um, by Terence McKenna, where he was saying that the only reason that we've allowed ourselves to behave the way we do with, with the world, with Mother Earth, is by A, believing she's inanimate, 
you know, that she's not alive. And <laughs> second, that we're separate. Yeah, because if she's inanimate, you can cut her open, you can open her up, and you don't feel, you don't feel the pain, right? It's like, it's like if, if, if I was peeing on somebody, it kind of like saying, well, that's like peeing in a river, like saying, you know, or like, or, or, or went through the whole scientific thing is like where you take apart science brutally or you're dissecting mice and you really don't care for their well being. It's like only believing that we are separate from nature and that nature is inanimate is the only thing that allowed us to be, be, be such assholes with nature. And so, so for me, I think that's the first place we need to change. And so, and so, I really want to see that conscientiousness everywhere. And, and I want to see, I want people to believe that it's not about expecting somebody else to bring a change, but it's saying, it's like, hey, where can I change and, and do something different? And from the party itself, I mean, the only thing I expect is for them to, from, for them to bring in those, those key aspects we were talking about, you know, a little bit, a little bit more ecological wisdom, a little bit more uh, a sense of social justice, a little bit more, you know, like feel with the heart. Uh, just a little bit more investment into social innovation and, you know, and help those people do their thing more um, grassroots uh, grassroots um, um, uh, civic participation. But funnily enough, the thing that really does it for me is this, you know, it's like, I really believe that, that, that nonviolence is one of the things we need everywhere and, and, and in discussion and when you're gonna build something, it's like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna build a pipeline here or a highway. Well, sure, we need development, but what's the cost of it? And really ask ourselves, you know, who's gonna reap, who's gonna reap the benefits and who's gonna bear the brunt of that decision? You know, and kind of like, I really like also the ideas like tread lightly, you know, it's like tread lightly. If you're gonna leave a mark, leave a good mark. And so, and so again, many of those transformations, which I think are necessary, are not even on a policy level, they are on a, very human education kind of thing. Yeah, but that's, that's boring. All right. Uh, sister, I want to check Facebook really quick and yeah. see, because I'm pretty sure we have friends watching us and cool. I want to see if, hey, if we have any questions from them and see what they're, what they want to ask us. Um, but so tell me something, how is the community? Are you still in touch with the Burning Man community? How are they doing? Um, I think, oh yeah, I'm definitely in touch with Burning Man community folks every day. Um, I think that people are sad to not be able to gather as much, but I've noticed a lot of people moving towards having smaller campouts where they're practicing social distancing, but you can still have fun together. Um, I think at first when this pandemic hit, all of us were hopping on like dance parties online and just doing a lot of like socializing but then there's been a little bit of a burnout of like over zooming um but i also think that i think that people are also taking this time to spend time with family at least i am mm -hmm. I, I think that there's this thing um with burners where we're super achievers and super doers and super resource intensive about our participation in community events and i feel like in some ways, this is giving everybody a little bit of a chance to recharge. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I, uh, I, I really look forward to when we can have another Nowhere and have another European Leadership Summit and actually like hug each other without masks. I don't know what, you, when that's going to happen. My president is certainly not, um, or the president of the United States, I won't even call him my president, certainly not doing anything to help that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm looking forward to being able to gather and like break bread with everybody again. It's important. The human contact is important. If, if, if God helps us and, and, and we don't have another lockdown or a second wave here in Lithuania, we're looking forward to doing the amber burn here. Oh, great. Um, and so I'd, li I'd like to close this beautiful conversation with a question because you've worked with all those regional burns and you've seen them scale, grow. Uh, you've seen some flourish. You've seen others flourish less. We're, we're, we've grown uh, almost doubled in size this year. We've gotten, we're up to 777 attendees and everything right. is sold out and we're already. What advice do you have for communities that need to scale because everybody like now likes to talk about scalable technology and, you know, scalable um, uh, schemes, growth, real. If you want to grow a community for real, how do you grow it? I really think that the participants 
um, need to understand that just because they're buying a ticket for something doesn't mean that someone else has to work for them. So really instilling in people the importance of volunteering, the importance, importance of covering shifts, the importance of kind of caring for the community. Because I think what can be divisive is when there's a big group of people that think that all they're doing the entire burn is just working. Um, and then other people that are just coming to party. So I think that there's um, a nuanced way to kind of maybe not mandate, but make it very um, appealing and also um, e express the importance of people taking shared ownership for making the thing go, whether that's them grabbing, um, you know, a, a shift at the greeters or one of the things that Nowhere does is they have theme camps adopt potties and then make sure that they have toilet paper and that they're like wiped down every day. Mm -hmm. So, and um, so I think that there's just some things where incentivizing the shifts that are needed and really making sure that, um, that there's an understanding and that there's communication out about the man hours and the time and the resources it takes to keep an event like that going and safe and really instilling in people the importance of them stepping up. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that's really important to the scalability. So there's like this whole issue of education of people kind of having a sense of the culture before they enter the space, right? Yeah, we, we, we've, I mean, I haven't, I've worked with the culture, like promoting the culture here in, in Lithuania. And um, both Erika and Povilas are also very active in the sense that they're kind of checking is like, who do we need here which are going to um, which are going to be good representatives of the culture so people can pick up the the you know can can pick it up from one another. I think there was even this whole thing about uh, maybe two years ago, because there's a burning man census, right? So people there's this there's this whole thing where where you know there's questions asked and you find out who's been attending the burning. One of the curious things about the Burning Man census is that somebody said that you need you need about 50% or like 40% of old timers of like previous people at the burn for the culture to actually replicate. And if you have too many new people, then the culture starts to break down because you don't have enough people kind of like passing on. Um, you don't have people passing on that kind of, kind of goodness or that programming from the source. Yeah, I think scaling, you know, fairly slowly is important, but a really good group for you to engage next, maybe it's real. So you got people that can really put up a shade structure, like no problem, and know how to make meals for 200 people. But I think they did a really nice job of scaling um, and making sure that people um, understood the, the value of civic responsibility. They do, but they have that whole military culture background, which helps them do that because they've all finished the service together and they've all been in the military for two years. So they'll follow orders and they like their stuff organized. They're really good at getting all that done. Yeah. Well, Megs, it's been lovely chatting with you. I, I've I, had you for more than half an hour. I, I've had so much fun. I hope that this has been useful. I've had, I just think that you're this amazing person. When you came to my camp this year and played music, we um, were telling everybody as like a, a kind of a cute joke that Manu Chow came to our camp and gave us a <laughs> private concert because the people <laughs> at the camp like think of you as like the most amazing entertainer, like super big and fabulous. And you are exactly you, but I thought it was so cute that they like started to spread like we had Manu Chow at our camp last mm -hmm. night. It's a compliment. You are amazing. And if I can be helpful at all, let me know. And also, please keep me updated on how things go with your organizing this, this season as we gear up for elections. Are your elections in November also? or uh, Similar, similar. They're in October, end of October. Yeah. Okay. So we'll be working on it. Yeah, and I, think, I hope there's lots of things which I'll be able to share with you in terms of experience or, or maybe, you know, just practical fun that can kind of shift people's mindset. I'll be sure to share that with you. <laughs> I'm so happy that we got to connect and thanks for thinking of me um, and I wish you um, well and give hugs to all of our Lithuanian friends and I will say ikipasimatimo. Ikipasimatimo, Megs, I love you. Mwah. Ciao, ciao. All ciao right, me. we'll be in touch.